Listen, I'm only technically a doctor, so I decided that in your guys' best interest, we'd bring a real sports doctor onto the scene. Someone that's been on the channel many, many times, but it's been a little while. Mr. Dr. Jesse Morse of the Fantasy Doctors is coming on today to talk about some of the running backs in the first five, six rounds of fantasy drafts that might be entering the year coming off some big injuries. You know, the Christian McCaffrey's, the Cam Akers, the Dobbins. Is. We're getting into them today. We're getting into the nitty gritty. Dr. Morse is extremely qualified. He's legitimately a sports doctor. He works with actual NFL athletes down in Florida. He is a board certified FM and a sports medicine physician. So make sure you throw him a follow. Make sure you subscribe to the Fancy Doctors YouTube channel. And tomorrow's video will be the wide receiver version of this one. So make sure you subscribe to our channel. And just a reminder, our season long draft guide is live. It's available on bdge.co. You can cop it there, but the least expensive and the easiest way to get it is by going to prizepicks.com and depositing $10 or more, just 10 bucks, on their website using promo code BDGE, and that'll get you a 100% deposit match on their website. We're about to nail some preseason games tonight. Plus, it'll get you access to our website absolutely free. Once you sign up, you'll be getting an email from us approximately 24 hours later giving you access to the website. So prizepicks.com, promo code BDGE. I'll give you one leg of the parlay we are hitting tonight, and that is Snoop Connor running back for the Jacksonville Jaguars, playing in the Hall of Fame game tonight, over 30 and a half rushing yards. There's no Travis Etienne. There's no James Robinson. They want to see what they got in this rookie, this talented rookie who's getting a lot of buzz out of camp. The first leg of your parlay on prize picks, absolute locker, 30 and a half, Snoop Connor over rushing yards. Let's tuck our shirts in and get into this fucking video. All righty, there he is, Dr. Jesse Morse of the Fantasy Doctors, the GOAT, my guy. It's been uh, it's been quite a long time since you've jumped back on the channel, but we are in full stride here. It is fantasy season, and uh, as I typically like to yell at my, uh, my audience members about, these injuries are one of the most underrated, underappreciated parts of fantasy, where if you just start to understand the science behind some of these things, and it's really not that difficult because you guys explain it really well, and a lot of the injuries recur over and over we see a lot of the same injuries within football so once you start getting like an understanding and a timetable you start to understand you know guys that you should be investing into guys you shouldn't be so today we are going to uh jump into a list of i think like six or seven key running backs that are getting drafted within the first like four or five six rounds that you guys need to have a better understanding of when it comes to their injuries the timetables whether or not they're injury prone all that kind of shit and what we can expect going into 2022 dr jesse morse how we doing how we living down there in florida it's hot brother we're doing good all the nfl guys are in camp so they're not near me anymore or at least most of them aren't uh everybody's doing good we're ramping up i'm excited for another fantastic season draft guide is in full swing yours looks good mine was a monster but i'm I, i'm ready and i'm ready to talk some injuries hell yeah um so i wanted to ask a, a general question about injuries and what you've seen because you've been in the practice for a long time so you have a lot of experience here and i'm curious with like the timetables because i've learned a lot of of these injuries and what to expect from them from you you know personally and guys like you in the industry that do a great job explaining them and it does seem like over the last few years we're seeing uh, a really quick upscale in like the progression that these players have made and and being able to return at a quicker um at a quicker rate so you know when you say things like you know acl tear is typically nine to 12 months it does seem like guys are progressing more quickly and it almost um I'd almost compare it to how like, you know, if you look back at NFL stats over the last 20 years, you might not, if you looked at all the 20 years of stats, you might not say, oh, this is a passing league because the first like 12 years or 15 years of that, of those like uh, of the 20 years might have been run heavy. But the last five years have been so pass heavy that it's hard to just, you, you almost want to be like the last 15 years don't matter. Like, and these yeah. last five years, seven years of science are what actually matters now is, yeah. um, is this a real thing that's happening like really, really quickly. I'm not wording this well, or I don't sound intelligent whatsoever, but I think you understand the point I'm getting at. Are these timetables that we're seeing for a lot of these injuries, whether it's ACL, Achilles, um, these things ramping up much quicker because of, of new science and new medicine and all this stuff? Yeah, we're definitely seeing a shift in the use of biologics. So your PRP, your stem cell, your all that type of stuff, which is kind of my specialty in, in 
a conjunction with orthopedics, traditional orthopedics. Uh, there's only a handful of surgeons that kind of re- that, that work on players. Um, or, you know, in general, the majority of the guys go to. Uh, a lot of them uh, kind of have their own protocols. Dr. Andrews uh, famously, uh, who pairs a ton of knees and, 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 and ACLs and shoulders, um, he uses a lot of bone marrow. He uses a lot of stem cells for six, seven, eight years now. Um, uh, uh, sticking with that staff, Lyle Kane, who's his partner, who did Jamison Williams and John Mechie's uh, ACLs this past year, they actually use GPS guided in game and in uh, practice stats and compare them to post surgery stats to say your break, you're coming out of your break at 12 degrees. It should be 20 degrees when you're healthy. And they're actually have data for that specific patient or, you know, player. Um, you have guys like, uh, Ella trash who's, who did acres, who did, uh, Dobbins, his knee, he did Brady's knee. He did, he done a bunch of knees. Um, they are using some other refining their techniques and just being, they seem to be getting a little bit better at them. They're probably using some additional products that we really don't know about because they don't tell us. And the rehab protocols are getting better and better. Um, the, the therapists are fantastic. You see the speed work uh, that a lot of these guys are doing with a bunch of different people throughout the country. And they're co- finally kind of getting more niche with it. So while the regular people may not be coming back faster, the pros are starting to come back faster. Uh, sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a little bit false kind of acres. We saw, you know, five and a half months, which is insane for mm-hmm. an Achilles, but he didn't really look very good, you know? So it's like, was it, you know, he, yeah, he was there, but was it actually what it, what we thought it was going to be? Or was it just, just for the appeasement of the fans? I, yeah. I don't know. It feels it feels like we can't necessarily say for sure. It's not it, we can't like move the timetables up because the literature is not there yet. It's like we're living through it now, and then in you know a year, two years, three years, we'll actually have like the scientific studies done saying like, oh, now the return timetable is this. Um, but you know, for fantasy, we kind of got to live in the moment, and we have to yeah. go off of guys' advices like yourself who are actually working with these athletes every day. And um, that's one of the things that like I appreciate you when I talk to you. You're always like progressive, forward thinking about how you're looking to uh, like help your clients you know it's like oh we're looking at you know prp we're looking at the stem cells we're looking at all these new scientific things that are not necessarily like mainstream yet but we see like great personal results that haven't hit scale because there's so many like processes and all this bullshit it has to go through yeah. in order for it to get like a it approved, I guess. How do you how do you go about like balancing that line of you know what's mainstream pushing you know pushing forward without like pushing too far? So it's tricky because um, if you want the team to do it, then they're going to be by the books. My mentor is the team doc for the Bucks, so I know pretty much most of their protocols. And I talked to him maybe a year ago, six months ago, and he was like, "We only use PRP. That's the the highest level we we'll use because that's what the data shows." Yeah. And well, at least to them, that's what the data shows. But there's a lot. The PRP is weak compared to some of the stuff that I use, but that's, they won't use it. So when I see players and I average one or two NFL guys a week, they, the team will never know about for the most part, what they did. It's not to be spoken of. There's no comments on it. You'll never find it on an injury report or the team doc report, nothing. Interesting. So those guys go out of their way to seek out these other treatments because yet they know they work. They know that they've had good luck with them, but unfortunately, A, the team doesn't want to pay for it or they're just not on board yet because they're old school and they're what I call rocks. They're just haven't adapted to it yet. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of wild. I would love to see some of the behind the scenes stuff. I know you can't really <laughs> share, unfortunately, but it's a, it's a wild, wild ride, I'm sure. Um, yeah. well, there's all types of crazy stuff that these guys can do safely, but the team just haven't adapted to it yet. Yeah, if I'm a player, I'm pushing the boundaries for sure. I'm like, oh, you want to stick this fucking thing in me? Go for it, baby. Is it going to make me 50-50 chance of making me way better? Let, you know, let's ride. These guys get injured so crazy. Like, a normal injury, these guys don't even feel. I'm like, you guys have to be, like, injured in order to, like, feel. It's crazy. Yeah, I'm they're... just like, it's crazy. It's like, oh, what what hurts you today? It's like, oh, it's only this today. But there's this, I mean, this, this, and this. It's That seems like over the last couple of years a question that Christian McCaffrey has gotten a lot of. What is hurt today? He's dealt with ankle sprains, high ankle sprains, AC joint, thigh injury, hamstring. Like, you name it, this dude has put it on his resume over the last two years. And he's a really interesting case study because he was obviously elite. And then the last two years, he's still been elite on a per game basis. We just haven't got a lot of games out of him. Now, another thing that I appreciate about you is the way that you break down these injuries. And we'll have a lot of people on Twitter just being like, you know, he's not injury prone and nothing about the previous injuries have anything to do with with what's going to happen going forward. But I also feel like that's too like analytical and you're looking at it from a very black and white situation 
there eventually becomes a point where these soft tissue injuries have to add up, right? There has to be some scar tissue building up where there there right. does become a little bit of a predictability behind the injuries that are coming up. So when it comes to C-Mac, based on like the severity of his injuries, do you think he's at a higher risk going forward? Like, are you someone that's going to be taking him at the 102, say Jonathan Taylor goes off the board, or is that a little bit too risky based on your projection of his like injury upside this year. So C-Mac's one of those guys that was like, had zero history of injuries until he had one. I mean, mm-hmm. he had a groin strain in college that missed Ooh. one game, which is impressive because sometimes they miss two or three. Um, and then after that, he didn't have any. I mean, his volume has been insane. Yeah. I mean, I, I calculated all the touches for all of all the basically main running backs in the NFL right now. He's at 1,869 touches, which is basically sixth behind Eckler, Cook, Henry, Gordon, Zeke, and Ingram. That's it. But up until, you know, two years ago, he had missed zero games. But now he's only played in 10 out of the past 33, you know? So, and, and, and when you look at the injuries, they're, they don't they don't add up per se. He's had a left high ankle. He's had a right hammy. He's had a, a squad injury. He's had a right AC. He's had a right high ankle, you know? So, they they don't directly correlate, but you at a point you're gonna say, well, something's happening to him, and he's really risky, in my opinion, at a uh, at a at the 102, 103, whatever. He's the ultimate high risk, high reward. A close second would be Saquon because he's not as expensive. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the problem with it is that if you said, all right, we'll give him a, a you we'll give 2020 a pass, okay, fluky year, but he did the same thing in 2021. So if you told me. At the end of this year, he only played eight games. Would you be surprised? Of course not. So that, like, that's the problem. Is that like yeah. you need him to play fourteen games, maybe thirteen, somewhere on there, and he has to be perfect in every one, which is possible and within the realm of, of normalcy. But almost every running back has missed at least two to three games a year. You know, there's a couple exceptions, but that's about it. So I just don't like the trend. And I have guys that have similar upside, but have much, much less risk. And in my opinion, I can't flop on my first round pick because it's really hard to win if you do. Yeah, it seems like everyone kind of has the same argument for C-Mac where they're like, oh, the upside is elite. What he did a couple of years ago and what's happened to him in the previous years is that they're all like kind of like fluky injuries. So it's almost as if they're saying his injury risk is as high as everybody else's because it wasn't an Achilles tear. It wasn't this or that. But I mean, coming from someone like you, it's like these things, they do matter. They add up. I know McCaffrey does uh, regenerative medicine because I know of him, but I haven't treated him. But the problem is, even though he's, what, 26 or whatever he is right now, it sounds funny, but he doesn't heal as quickly as 22. And these guys, it's like he ha- he's like a 2018 car, a 19 car that has like 200,000 miles on him. I mean, he's been rode hard in a short period of time. The body's not exactly meant to do that. We have a couple freaks that did it for a while, but in my opinion, he has to prove that he can stay healthy and then I'm back on the train. And until he does that, I'll take the L. It's just too risky for my for my taste. So where do you where do you have him in your rankings, your RB rankings? I think he's around 10. RB 10 nine. or overall 10? Yeah. Uh, RB 10. Woo! Okay, that's, that's spicy. Well, because I'm baking in like six six games missed. Yeah. I mean, we see he's elite when he's on the field. We know that. Yep. I mean, I caught a lot of slack last year because I had Saquon at like RB25 to start the season. And I'm like, well, you're not going to draft him at 25, obviously. But where did he end up? I don't know. It's probably about there. Yeah. So I don't look at it at the beginning of the season because I'm looking at it. Well, in hindsight, what did he end up finishing? And that's kind of what you should be doing. I don't care what he does in week one. I care what if he's going to take me to championship. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm, J- I'm, I'm team JT 101 no matter what. So uh, if I have that top pick, that's where I'm going with it. I suggest y'all do the suggest the rest of y'all do that as well. Um, Mr. Derrick Henry has also been absolutely rode into the ground, possibly mm-hmm. into his coffin. But his injury or his his outlook is really interesting, too, because he deals with this foot fracture last year. He misses like eight or I think he misses nine games, maybe. But he comes back yep. for their playoff game. Yep. So it doesn't feel like going into this year, whatever happened to him last year is necessarily a concern for this year, unless uh I'm misinterpreting his injury, but it feels like it's not like the Cam Akers injury where it's like, oh, he lost explosiveness b- due to this. And that's not something that like the timetable necessarily has uh, has a factor into like Derrick Henry. Are you nervous about him going into this year based on the fact that he came back already last year? Nope. I have zero risk for that foot injury. Can you refracture it? Yes. Julio Jones did it two and a half years later. It happens. Greg Olson, he ended his career. But that's usually because guys come back too quickly. 
I remember yeah. Olsen came back in like fucking five weeks or something like that. Yeah, the crazy. data shows under nine weeks, and that's what James Robbins, the James Washington. This is the hidden injury he just had. He comes back before really nine and say ten to be lucky. You're a very high risk of refracturing it. If you wait until after that, the data is the same at ten weeks, at fifteen weeks, at whatever. The, the data is the same. He didn't have a traditional screw, which would basically go through the, the base of the fifth. Mm -hmm. He had a plate um, and, and screws for whatever reason, but without, just the way they get it. The same doc that did his injury years before because he fractured his leg back in 2013 um on the opposite leg the same doc did it um dr kane for the the team doc for the alabama um and, and and for him this is a fracture so this is not a soft tissue injury and, and soft tissue injuries your acls your achilles those are the ones that concern you because tissues really never are the same and even then it's a trust issue once that fracture is healed or a screw is healed and everything then you really don't have to worry about it and he's looked fantastic we've seen him in, in a lot of off-season videos running up hills and doing all types of crazy derrick henry stuff i have some concerns about the team in general whether or not yeah. he gets the volume and you know the o-line and you know wide receiver so i have other issues but i'm not concerned about his injury yeah that's how that's how i see it too like i'm not concerned about the injury i think my one my concern is his the run blocking line is really poor i'm also concerned that this offense is just going to fall right off a cliff without any like field stretchers there and i could yeah. see him just not get i mean obviously he creates for himself and will turn a, an 80 an 80 yard run is a goal line carry for him basically but now i don't know if he'll get that many goal line carries which is what makes me drop him down a little bit off the board but at the end of the day he's still derrick henry hello he'll, he'll yeah. always have a high chance of getting injured because he's getting 400 touches a year anybody yeah that does that will you know we'll have it but it's good to know that the foot injury is not necessarily what's going to be scaring people off of him this year correct yeah no concerns with king henry in the foot all right well saquon we were both off of him last year and i'm bite i'm 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 in on saquon this year something that you taught me long ago that has treated me very well is we like dudes two years removed from the acl tear not the first year back because one physically sometimes they push it but two as you've brought up like the mental aspect of this is very very important it's like you need to have as a player 100 percent confidence in order to be able to cut change direction get that explosion back in your game and it felt a little bit clear to me even like the reports throughout the summer were saying that saquon like might be ready for week one might not be right even that little bit of hesitancy tells me that he needs to be pushed really really far down your draft if, if they're not like he's in full practice mode for like three weeks heading to the season i don't really want a part of him this year he's coming off of you know other injuries after the acl tear the low ankle sprain last year some other nonsense that he dealt with that i'm not too concerned about i don't think i mean you could tell me otherwise but saquon full feels like he's going into the year actually healthy i don't think there's any injury that's like necessarily predictable going into this year the O line's a little bit improved. They've got a new off uh, head coach with a new system. I kind of like the 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 whole um, situation he's got going on. I mean, it's not perfect, obviously, but I like Saquon this year. I agree. I mean, I agree. So Saquon is one of those guys where you're buying him because you're hoping he repeats his rookie season, and it that was what two thousand yards ago? from scrimmage, whatever it was, three, four, yeah. or four years ago. I think it was by now. And that was his ago. last healthy season. Mm -hmm. You know, and in 2019, he had uh, a, a that high ankle sprain that cost him three games, which lingered the whole season. They're awful injuries. Uh, and that was early in the season. Uh, and then he obviously tore his ACL almost a year to the day after the high ankle. And then last year, um, he tore or he, he injured his left ankle. We don't know exactly what happened. And it wasn't just a simple injury because it, it had to have been more complicated than that. He surprisingly only missed four games. Um, and they're like, well, it was his left ankle, he, you know, but. If you have a right ankle injury, a right ACL injury, a you know multiple right ankle injuries, that's your weak side. So what are you doing? You're compensating on your left side, right? You're going to use your left side more to take stress off your right. That's going to cause more stress on the left side, in my opinion. So as a result, it doesn't take a whole lot to land on someone's foot when you're crossing and, 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 and create this crazy thing. And that's all it takes, right? We saw this huge leg blew up, ankle, and that was it. He was actually running, turning into form right before that happened. He actually was starting to look good. Mm -hmm. I think he trusts his knee again. The quads are back if you've seen him. Because <laughs> hard, hard when, him, you, yeah. when you tear his ACL, the, the knee goes into protection mode and it doesn't want to grow, the, the quad. So once the knee is stable, the quad starts to grow again because it's like, oh, the knee's good. I don't have to protect it really anymore. So now you start to, the quads look similar. You're like, I don't even know which knee he tore. Um, that's good. 
Now we might see Dayball use him in all types of crazy configurations. If he can stay healthy, and that's obviously a big if, he could be a league winner. So you look at him the same way like you look at C-Mac, though, because it's like, oh, eventually all these injuries start to like add up a little bit, and you're like, mm, I'm concerned about the health, but it seems like you're more in on Saquon because of his price tag. It's like you're taking exactly. C-Mac, but you get him around two rounds later. If, C-Mac, if, if, if CMC was available at like mid two to late two, I think yeah. that's a no brainer, but you can't, right? You, you're, if somebody's going to get them before that, either, either they're going to be right or they're going to learn one of the two. Yeah. I don't know what's going to be this year. Yeah. Um, there's, there's another dude that I'm a really big fan of this year and I've seen nothing but like incredible reports out of camp about him and his speed and explosiveness. And that's Travis Etienne, the first mm-hmm. round pick by Jacksonville last year, missed all of last year with the midfoot sprain, the Liz Frank injury. Um, yep. And I watched your video on it. You're not concerned with this injury right now. And it doesn't seem like anybody in Jacksonville is concerned whatsoever. So from an injury standpoint, right, we're, it's not like, I guess, I mean, we could touch about James Robinson too, obviously coming back from the Achilles tear itself. ETN seems like a full go. And I guess right. his his concern is like, is he the goal line back there? Uh, does he get three down workhorse status? Maybe unlikely. Uh, James Robinson coming back from the Achilles tear that happened at the end of the year. Now, everyone points to Cam Akers, uh, but the reports have been really, really positive, I guess, out of Jacksonville about James Robinson's um, return, right? So, like, where where are you at on this backfield right now, situationally, injury-wise? Like, break it down for us. So, midfoot sprains are really frustrating. Think of your foot as a bridge. The heel is one part of the bridge. The, the toes are the other part of the bridge. And the middle of the foot, which is where the Liz Frank ligament is, is the middle of the bridge. If you were to knock out some of those stones in the middle of the bridge and ask you, would you drive over? You'd say, of course not. It's going to collapse. Mm-hmm. That's essentially what happens when the Liz Frank ligament gets sprained. It basically causes collapsing of the middle of the foot. So basically what you have to do is you have to put a screw literally right through it. Uh, if it's a grade one, it it's usually not too bad. You miss about a month. It's a grade two, it's about two months. And sometimes they go to surgery. Grade threes go to surgery all the time because they, they're not stable. That's what he had. He had a grade three, so done for the year. If they were competitive, he might have been able to return in December. The data on those is really good for a re-injury rate for that type of stuff. There is some data to support that there may be a decrease in overall performance by up to 21%, but we don't know what his performance is. So we don't really have a comparison. He was a freak in college. I mean, he's with his college QB. He has incredible hands. They're going to use them all over the place. I think James Robinson will get cleared. I don't know if he's going to have explosiveness. And that's part of the problem with Achilles tears is that they lose their explosiveness. And that's what Akers showed. He's like, he just kept getting hit behind the line or just running into people. That's why Sony looked so good because he wasn't good, but he looked better. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think James Robinson will get some love. Um, but I have some concerns uh, about his explosiveness, and that's why I think ETM will look so much faster. There was a video that popped up, I think it was yesterday or today, when you saw ETN running, and you see his left foot, which is the one he fractured, and it looks really straight. And then there's his right foot. He's kind of like angling it. I don't really like how he does that. He might be putting additional stress, and that just may be how he runs. I think it's uh, how so, he runs. I, I think he always had like a really kind of weird, awkward style of running, honestly. I just hope it doesn't mess with his right foot, no. <laughs> uh, but I am super high on ETN. I do think he has top five potential. He has all the characteristics. He's a thick back. Um, and, 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 and realistically, he could be a smash. Um, I'm not overly concerned about James Conner, but I think that may help him stay a little bit fresh, which is kind of what we need, at least, yeah, you know. Yeah, the James Robinson situation is tricky because it's like you, almost as fantasy players, you got to figure out two things. It's like, one, does he have his explosiveness back? If he does, that's bad news for ETN because Robinson is going to stay on the field for a long time. Likely, probably not because we have the research on the Achilles tear, but the problem still stems from like, even if he's not explosive, does Tug Peterson do the Jack? Jacksonville coaching staff just be like, we don't really care. We just want a big body back on the field. We don't care that he's giving us 3.6 yards per carry. Let's just still give him 10 carries and goal line work. And that's where the situation becomes yeah. like tough. It gets to tricky. F- yeah, to figure out. So it's like it's it's definitely a little bit um disturbing if you're an etn guy if you're really really on him which i am but i will be following those reports extremely closely as will i for the baltimore ravens backfield we have both jk dobbins and gus edwards coming back from 
ACL tears. Now, J.K. Dobbins tore more than just his ACL, which was a more significant injury to him. And now they're saying, I don't know, the reports are a little bit confusing. I, I assumed Gus was going to be back earlier because it was less significant. But they're mm-hmm. saying J.K. Dobbins is ahead of him in terms of his recovery. Now it feels like Gus is not going to be ready for um, week one. And Dobbins might be. But again, this is one of those situations where it's like, it's so iffy right now that it doesn't make me feel comfortable whatsoever. And it's like, I already know I want all the Dobbins in 2023. I don't know if I want any of him in 2022 already. So like, where are you at on this? How realistic do you think it is for Dobbins to be on the field week one? And then also, I guess with Gus Edwards. So initially we were on the same page. It sounded like Gus Edwards was farther ahead, but we, so here's the funny thing. I usually can find out who did the surgery, what additional injuries they had in the knee, when the surgery was done, like everything. I couldn't find anything about Gus Edwards, literally. Besides the fact that he has a knee, I couldn't find anything else out. It was ridiculous. I'm like, why can't I find anything? So I didn't really, I was kind of speculating because I'm like, well, it must be doing okay. Let's, we haven't heard anything bad. And I didn't heard of any bad. But the problem is the data is kind of funny. The higher up the draft pick, the better off they do in their recovery, which is kind of weird, but that's what it shows. Whether it's resources or genetics or just what made them elite to begin with. Yeah, it's probably some weird correlation to them. I mean, them being more athletic, better recovery, higher draft. Yeah, some weird yeah. stuff like that. And, and so it does show that, and, and and that may play a role here too, because obviously they, they tore him within, I think, oh, 10 days apart or something. Um, uh, Dobbins did have his LCL reportedly as well as it was contact, which is not common. Remember, it was kind of yeah. when he hit the dude as opposed to just blowing it out. Patrick did. Um, the So I think it's possible Dobbins is ready for week one. I don't know if the Ravens want to push him. I know he wants to. We heard him, you know, commenting on, on social media and whatnot earlier a couple weeks ago about that. But realistically, he may he may be ready. I don't know if I trust him. Mm-hmm. We may see Mike Davis. We may see more Beatty. I don't think Gus Edwards is going to be ready. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets puck, which is four games. Here. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm right there with you. I, 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 where my head is at right now is I'm, I'm so sure that Mike Davis is going to piss off fantasy owners this year. It's, he just seems like the perfect Baltimore running back that's going to go in there and catch more passes than J.K. Dobbins, get some of the goal line work, and it just doesn't feel like Dobbins is going to get the workhorse role this year that we really want him. And it's unfortunate because like the, the you need momentum them to really capture a backfield as a running back in the NFL you know it's like you need like Dobbins had it going into last year before he tore it and now it's like he's taking st- two steps back to hopefully take one yep. forward and it's like the time frame to really capture a backfield is so so short and hopefully it didn't close on Dobbins but I'm, I'm definitely um I'm definitely weary on Dobbins I am a little bit less weary on Ezekiel Elliott going this year I'm mm. I feel pretty good about a bounce back from him I don't know if we'll see like any sort of explosion from him. I believe he tore his like PCL at one point mm-hmm. last year. It was like week four, week five. And prior to that, he was really, really good for fantasy. He was averaging like 18 to 20 fantasy points per game. He was on pace for like RB5 type numbers. And the injury happened. I don't exactly know when it happened, but it seems like it was coinciding with a right around that time. And then he just fell off, turned into fucking mashed potatoes. And everybody was like, Tony Pollard, Tony Pollard. But it feels like, I mean, they're back to throwing Zeke all the love. And this is an offense that you obviously want parts of. They have a good offensive line. Yeah, they score a lot. They're fast paced. Like Kellen Moore has just been a magician there as the OC since he's taken over. So Zeke, are you? I mean, I'm assuming we're not worried about the injury from last year, but are we just worried about him slowing down overall? Like, do we think he's someone worth investing like a, a end of third, fourth round pick in this year, just based on being in that offense? So, uh, great question. Um, before I, I answer that, I want to thank your your you know watchers and 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 let them know that. Uh, the, the Fantasy Doctors Injury Draft Guide is available. And if you use the code BDGE, they will get $10 off. So it's 25, it goes to 15 using that code TFDinjuryDraftGuide.com. It's available on Amazon, but that code won't apply there. So it's massive, it's ridiculous, and you can read about all the stuff we're talking about. Uh, that's just for your uh, your viewers. It's really, so, it's really, really good. If you think this video is good at all, the, the amount of depth that, uh, that doc goes into in the draft guide is fucking incredible so well worth the 15 dollars that you'll be able to spend on it now with the promo code uh, what's the website it's available on again tfd injury draft guide.com tfd injury draft guide.com go get that sheesh so z you want to see the craziest data i've ever seen he has 2588 touches since freshman year of college the only player active running back that's higher than him is mark ingram 
Zeke has a total of one game missed. Damn. Like, he really, bro? Fed. He probably should have missed games last year. That's a separate discussion. Yeah. But the dude plays. He just plays. Like, that's it. So what happened to him? He's been declining, right? With that volume, you're going to decline in some capacity. But they owe him a lot of money. And he is an, a fantastic blocker, and they still trust him. He tore his PCL, which is the ligament that crisscrosses with the ACL. Can you play on a partially torn PCL? Yes. He did it. Yeah. What happens? Your knee sags backwards. So when you step down, it's almost like sitting on a chair that has a loose leg. It's like, whoa, what just happened? That's what happens on a PCL. The PCL is responsible for keeping the leg taut and not going backwards. ACL is forwards. The problem is it doesn't heal well without time. You can, They will heal and his is probably healed now. But not when you're playing every seven days. It just it doesn't have time to heal. Um, he tore it or partially tore it on uh, October 6th. Didn't miss a game the entire year. He played through a rib injury four days later. Then he re-injured it on October uh, November 7th, basically a month later. And then two weeks later, he re-injured it again. So that's going to lack a limit your explosiveness, which is basically what happened. I have zero concerns about this knee in terms of the PCL. Whether or not he's losing some steam is justifiable. But who are they going to use? Gallup's going to start on IR. James Washington is going to start on IR because of his Jones fracture. They basically got CeeDee Lamb. They got rookie Tolbert. They got Schultz and then Pollard for whatever he is, which is basically the same age as Zeke for what it's worth. So it's like they're This is one of the biggest points I've been making, too. I think people are going to look back at this. Zeke is going to be really involved in the passing. That's what's going to end up happening because they don't have the targets to go around anywhere else. They don't have the weapons outside of CeeDee Lamb. He's like the only legitimate pass catching weapon there. Zeke's going to get a ton of dump. It was like two years ago that he got 95 targets. He was getting annually 75, 90 targets. Like, we're going to see another year like that, and people are going to look back and be like, fuck, how didn't we see this? So one of my things is like, I don't even really need Zeke to be that, like, production field on the ground like I don't I don't need him to get 350 carries I don't need him to run for 1500 yards I do think he's gonna get upwards of 75 80 85 targets this year and be a really good back just based on that so as long as the knee is good to go and he could stay on the field which is something he always does I'm, I'm very much in on Zeke I mean if you look at it he did 10.2 I think somewhere on there points per game with a pretty much a useless knee in so many words I mean imagine if it's 50 percent better could you take 15 16 points a game for what he's going for now and, and the reliability of him, you may not get this. Maybe you get the smash mode games where he gives you 30 or some crazy number. But, you know, he's a very high floor and has some, some ceiling left in an offense that's going to be potent. And we know he's going to be a big part of it. So I, I think he's relatively no brainer if that's the route you're going uh, with your with your build. Yeah. I mean, if you go wide receiver heavy and then wrap up with you know i mean saquon in the third i don't think saquon really goes in the third anymore but like you can grab zeke yeah. as your as your rb1 rb2 after getting a really really strong start to your uh to your fantasy season and i'm very much in on him so we've gone through c-mac derrick henry saquon etn jk dobbins zeke and cam Akers, and that will wrap up today's video but a few things to leave you with before we go make sure that you are subscribed to the fantasy doctors youtube channel which will be linked down below uh, they do crazy updates throughout the season, like literally borderline real time. It, it is one of the most or the biggest advantages you could have throughout your fantasy season is staying on top of these injuries, especially on like waiver wire nights. These guys bring you what you fucking need immediately. So it's one of the best channels for fantasy football that you could subscribe to without a doubt. And then make sure you go check out the Fantasy Doctors Injury Draft Guide, which we have also linked down below. Use promo code BDG. It'll get you $10 off. Uh, you can go follow Doc on Twitter link down below you know the fucking deal all right so subscribe to the channel subscribe to their channel hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed and we'll be back tomorrow with the wide receiver edition of this same featured film adios doc